Okay, so today we start a new chapter, chapter seven, which is on sampling. So we just completed chapter six in Monday's class. And today we start a new topic, which is sampling. And sampling is, uh, as maybe some of you may be aware already, so sampling essentially bridges a continuous time signal with a discrete time signal. Okay, so you have a continuous time signal X of T. And when you sample, what you get is a discrete time signal. Uh, let me call it X S of N, which is the sampled signal. Okay, and why is this typically useful? So let's look at the specific example of a vehicle. So you have an accelerator pedal position. And of course, when you're driving a vehicle, you will probably press hard the accelerator in some case. Oh, let me draw a better diagram. So you are accelerating the car, so you're pressing the pedal more and more, and then you keep the pedal steady for some time, and then you have to decelerate, so you start braking. So then you, you stop pressing the accelerator, and you start pressing the brake command, and this is what the maybe accelerator slash brake, because you only press one of the two things, either accelerator or brake. So this is what happens. This is the sort of uh, continuous time signal that you're inputting to the vehicle. However, the way things work, this continuous time signal needs to then con be converted into a discrete time signal so that it can be communicated to the engine that, well, you need to You need to start accelerating the vehicle, then you need to keep the velocity steady, and then you need to slow down the vehicle. So this is typically done because the engine control units will take discrete commands. Because the firing that happens in the cylinder actually happens at discrete time intervals. It doesn't happen in a continuous time interval. So. So there is automatically sampling going on, going on in the vehicle for this particular reason. Uh, now, suppose you are on the surface of Mars. You are on the surface of Mars, you have a rover. What does a rover look like? Well, I'll just make it like this. You have a rover that is uh, taking pictures and you want to send it to Earth. and you have limited communication bandwidth. So because you have a limited bandwidth, you can't really, so let's say your, your rover is clicking pictures at the, uh, at the rate of 30 Hertz. So it is taking 30 pictures within one second, but because of the limited bandwidth, you cannot really send 30 pictures well, okay, actually let me make a different. So I'm gonna make a small change in my statement. So the camera is sensing the picture at every point of time, right? It's a continuous time signal. However, if the camera wants to send this continuous stream of pictures to earth, it's just impossible because you don't really have that much bandwidth to send um, the whole, uh, uh, you know, pictures that you, you the, the whole video that the camera is, taking on the surface. So what it will do is it will sample at a frequency of maybe one picture per second or maybe one picture every five seconds. And it will take those pictures and then encode those pictures into uh, electromagnetic waves. And then it will send those electromagnetic waves to earth. And then you will of course capture it and you will view those pictures on earth. So again, because of the limited bandwidth, it makes, um, so sampling would be required. Sampling is required 
to reduce the communication burden. Okay, so you have a continuous time signal and it, it costs a lot of effort to send this continuous time signal to Earth. So instead of taking the continuous time signal, what you will do is you will sample and you will send those samples to Earth. And hopefully you can reconstruct to a certain degree of accuracy, you can reconstruct exactly what the rover is seeing, the sequence of things rovers is seeing uh, on the planet Mars. Okay, so again, in this case, sampling is required to reduce uh, the communication burden. So what exactly happens in a sampling? Like what, what is happening mathematically when you're doing sampling? So you have a signal, X of T, continuous time signal, X of T, and I have an impulse train P of T, and P of T is given by delta T minus N capital T. So this capital T is the periodicity of sampling process. So this is my time. This is zero T, two T, and so on. This is my impulse train P of T. And a sampled signal called XP of T, it's a continuous time signal. It's just XT times PT. So I'm multiplying the impulse train with the continuous time signal X of T. Let's see what this means. What would this summation be equal to? Can someone tell me what this summation looks like? You can use the sampling property of the impulse function anyone wants to try would n just go from negative two to positive two or oh no no this is this this impulse train goes all the way to infinity oh okay okay yeah yeah so so you are right if it was only between minus 2t to plus 2t then it would go from minus 2 to plus 2 but this is an infinite impulse train well the sampling property says that x of t multiplied by delta t minus nt this is actually X of NT delta T minus NT. That's the sampling property of impulse function. So this actually becomes X of NT delta T minus NT. This is the sampling property. Have we seen this property anywhere else before? Yes, uh, in lecture three, I think. Lecture three, okay. Lecture two, three, unit impulse, there it is. This was the sampling property in discrete time. 
uh, in property of impulse function. That's the discrete time. And then there was a continuous time sampling property. There it is. This is the continuous time sampling property. This is from lecture three. Okay, it's been a little while. Yeah, yeah, it's been a long time since then. Okay, so this is what the XP of T looks like. Now let's look at the, um, the what is that called? The frequency, not the frequency response. What is it called? Fourier transform. So let's look at the Fourier transform of XP of T. So I know that XP of T is xt multiplied by pt so the fourier transform of xp of t which is xp of j omega anyone remembers what so this is multiplication in time domain so what would it be in the fourier domain convolution convolution, convolution perfect so let's do the convolution in fourier domain i have x of j theta times p of j omega minus theta d theta oh uh, i guess i yeah i think it's fine it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity now x of j theta is something that is given because that's the fourier transform of x of t but this term actually is Fourier transform of P of T. So P of J omega is actually given by two pi over T K equals minus infinity to plus infinity omega minus omega S where omega S is two pi over T. This is Fourier transform of impulse strain. I'm not quite sure whether we have derived the Fourier transform of impulse strain or not. Oh, I think there should be a K here. So delta omega minus K omega S. Yeah, so I'm not sure if I have, we have done the derivation of Fourier transform for impulse strain, but it's uh, easy to derive this expression from P of T. I have derived something for impulse strain, maybe Fourier series for impulse strain. That was done in the class, but not the Fourier transform. Uh, let me let me go back and check where did we derive the Fourier series for impulse strain. Hopefully everyone has noted it down. Please make sure that you write k to, k omega s k was missing, so I added this later. Now no. This was for rectangular wave. No, no. Continuous time. Yeah, there it is. So Fourier series for impulse strain. So that was done in lecture 12. We derived this expression in the class. So uh, the AK was one over T in the case of Fourier series. And remember, the way to go from a Fourier series to a Fourier transform, that was derived in lecture 18, maybe? No, 17, no, 16, periodic signal, there it is. So in lecture 12, we derived the Fourier series for impulse strain. And in lecture 16, we talked about how to extend the Fourier series for a periodic signal to the Fourier transform of that periodic signal using this delta function. And the more general expression was given right here. 
So we are essentially using these two concepts, one from lecture 12 and the other one from lecture 16 to derive the Fourier transform for the periodic, for the impulse train in today's lecture, which is lecture 24. So things that we have done in 12, lecture 12 and lecture 16, just to remind you, oh, today's lecture 25. Okay, so that's long time back. So this is what the Fourier transform for impulse train looks like. Let me write lecture 12 plus lecture 16. Gets us to this particular derivation. So now uh, going back to our original discussion, we want to compute this XP of J omega so I know that x small xp of t, the time signal is multiplication of two times time signal. So therefore the Fourier transform will be the convolution of the two Fourier transform. I know what p of j omega looks like. So I can get xp of j omega as after doing some algebra, So that's what we get as XP of J omega. Now let's look at what does this look like in the next slide. So here is my signal X of J omega, uh, the Fourier transform of XT. And I'm assuming that this is a band limited signal, which means that the frequency range of X of J omega is only between omega M minus omega M and omega M. Now this is my P of J omega where uh, I have zero omega S, two omega S, three omega S, and you have an impulse signal along each of these, at each of these values of omega. Are these graphs from the book? Yes, these are all figures. Can you give a page number please? Yes, I can give you the page number. Thank you kindly. 517. And page 518. Okay. So now two cases arise. One is, uh, so you could have omega s, which is larger than or less than two omega m, okay? So these are the two cases that can happen. Omega m is the, uh, the upper bound on the frequencies that are there in X of t. Omega s is the frequency, the, the frequency of my impulse train. Now this is the situation that happens when omega s is greater than two omega m. And this is the case that happens when omega s is less than two omega m. So when omega s is greater than two omega m, then your xp of j omega is sort of repeated after every omega s interval. When omega s is less than two omega m, so then there is some overlap because of the convolution and this is the kind of behavior you see in XP of J omega. Okay, and I want you to stare at this graph for some time, these two graphs, and understand these two limits, omega is greater than two omega M and omega is less than two omega M. 
and try to think about how do we reconstruct x of t back? Maybe that's a difficult question to answer, but just think about, so this is what I, this is the question I want to pose to you at this point of time. Under what conditions would you be able to recover x of t from x of pt? So the question is, can we recover x of t from xp of t? So I'm given xp of t, which is x of t multiplied by p of t. I know xp of j omega. So if omega s is greater than two omega m, xp of j omega looks like this. When omega s is less than two omega m, my xp of j omega looks like this. And this is the question I'm asking. And let's go back to 1930s. So about a hundred year back. Okay, so here is the observation, the very, very important observation. So what I can do in XP of J omega, when I look at XP of J omega, I kind of know that my X of J omega is being replicated and I'm not losing any information here. So therefore it's quite likely that I can recover X of T from, from this particular situation because I'm not losing any information. I'm just replicating more and more information in the Fourier domain, but I'm not losing anything in the Fourier domain. So perhaps there is a way to recover X of T back by looking at X of PT. On the other hand, if I look at this particular situation, I see that in the Fourier domain, I'm losing out some information. I'm losing out what's happening here, because all I see is this top line, right? And I don't quite know what's happening in this region. I don't know what's happening in this region. So I'm losing some information here. So I'm losing some information. So it's quite likely that I won't be able to recover the original signal back by observing XP of T. So that's a very high level uh, intuition by looking at these two graphs, okay? Now this is exactly the case, and this was established by Nyquist in the Nyquist sampling theorem. Many of these folks uh, that you study, Bode, Nyquist, and all that in signals and systems and in control, uh, controls class, they were all mathematicians. They were all mathematicians of 1930s and 1920s. And they were working with predominantly AT&T Bell Labs at that time in developing the communication system, the next generation of communication systems in 1930s. And in those contexts, many of the results that we study were derived for communication system. Now, AT&T is still around, but Bell Labs is not really that, that significant in stature today as in comparison to what it was in 1930s. So in fact, if you graduated with a PhD in mathematics in 1920s and people asked you, where do you want to go and work? You would say that I want to go to Bell Labs and I want to work there. Okay, that was the Google of 1920s. Now everybody wants to work for Google or Facebook or Amazon if they're graduating from a math department or applied math department. Okay, uh, so this was Nyquist sampling theorem. So what was Nyquist's insight? So if XT is band limited, which means that X of J omega is equal to zero for all omega, greater than equal, well, greater than omega m. Mm -hmm. 
then xt can be uniquely determined uniquely determined okay so you can recover xt exactly by its samples x of nt n is an integer positive and negative integer if omega s is greater than 2 omega m remember that omega s is 2 pi over capital t This is the famous, it's actually a very famous result, Nyquist sampling theorem. If XT is band limited, then you can recover the original signal just by looking at the samples of that signal, as long as the sampling frequency is greater than some threshold. So this is The threshold is of course two omega m. So as long as you can sample sufficiently fast, you can actually recover the original signal. This is the case for band limited signals. So XT is band limited, okay? Which means that X of J omega equals to zero for omega greater than omega m. Now I'll tell you why mathematically this particular theorem is so cool. Okay, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, right now we have all this uh, uh, language of signals and systems. So probably understanding this result is not that difficult, but there is a mathematical reason why such a, such a, uh, such a theorem is very, very important mathematically. So I have a continuous time signal and I know that it's a band limited signal. This is, maybe I need to make it periodic. No, I don't need to make it periodic. Uh, okay, so it's not a periodic signal. It's my X of T and it's band limited. And I'm going to sample it. And when I sample it, I'm losing a lot of information. So in the case of sampling, lost a lot of information. Or actually we didn't really lose, well, the whole theorem is that we actually didn't lose anything, but there is an, from a mathematical viewpoint, we have actually lost the information of what the signal looks like so we know what the signal looks like at these discrete time intervals, but I don't quite know what the signal looks like in between these two time intervals. I don't know what the signal looks like, right? It could look like anything in between these two points in time. It turns out that Nyquist is saying that, well, as long as XT is band limited and you're sampling at a sufficiently high frequency, you can exactly reconstruct exact reconstruction is actually possible by just looking at discrete, the values at discrete time intervals. That is the beauty of this Nyquist sampling theorem, that even though we might argue or we might think that, oh, we are losing a lot of information, 
because we don't know what's happening in between these two time steps. But in reality, we're actually not losing anything. Okay, does that make sense? That's the most uh, salient feature of Nyquist sampling theorem. We are not losing any information. Okay. Any questions so far on Nyquist sampling theorem? Have any of you seen this in any other context, any other course that you may have studied? This is a first for me. Okay. Anyone else who may have? No one? Okay. I, I think this was in our uh, previous like intro to signals and systems class. Yeah, it's in 2050. Yeah. Oh, it was? Okay. Okay. Well, very, very briefly. Okay. Well, so now, now today we will study why this can be done in a more mathematically rigorous fashion using the knowledge and terminology of signals and systems. Okay. Now let's go back. So this dude, Nyquist, came and said, well, you know, mathematically you can reconstruct the signal and all that. Now the question is, how do we do it in reality? So I have this uh, X of T. I multiply it by an impulse strain P of T. I get my XP of T. And if you think about it, your XP of T, the Fourier series of XP of T looks like, okay, this is your omega equals zero. This is my X of P of J omega. And this is omega. Now, how do I recover X of T? What should I pass it through so as to recover X of T? What do you think? Now remember, what, what does X of T, what is X of J omega looks like? X of J omega should look only like this. Okay. This is what my X of J omega should look like. Okay, so I want you to tell me what should I pass the signal through so as to get this X of J omega. Could you do some step functions with time? Well, shifts? okay, good, good. So you talked about step function in time. Well, what about step function in frequency? Is there a low pass filter? Yeah, it's a low pass filter. That's right. So if, let me pass it through a low pass filter. Ideal low pass. Let me make it ideal low pass filter. So this is minus omega m. This is omega m. And this is omega s. So I can pick anything between omega M to omega S. Uh, no, not omega M to omega S. Omega M to omega S over two. Let me pick omega M. I don't want to confuse anyone. So let me pick minus omega m to omega m, an ideal low pass filter. So it passes every frequency with no attenuation whatsoever between minus omega m to plus omega m. 
and then it it basically doesn't pass any frequency outside of omega m so because i'm passing it through an ideal low pass filter i know that my xp of j omega will get multiplied by h of ilp of j omega right that's what happens when you have a time domain signal going into a system and then you come out then the frequency response of the no the output of the system is the system's frequency response multiplied by the input the the fourier transform of the input so then i get i reconstruct x of j omega exactly at the output let me call this xr just to make a distinction that this is a recovered signal and in this case because i have passed it through an ideal low pass filter i have exact recovery x of rt is exactly equal to x of t and that's what nyquist theorem was all about Okay, let's see it in figure. This figure is from page five one nine of the book. So I have this signal x of t. This is my. It's not visible. P of t equals to summation delta n my t minus n t. This is my impulse train. Uh, and then I get xp of t. I want to pass it through some system h of j omega such that I recover x of rt. This is my Fourier transform of the input signal. This is the Fourier transform of x of p. This is my low pass filter. ideal low pass filter uh, where the cutoff frequency omega c we have omega m less than omega c less than omega s minus omega m so the cutoff frequency of the low pass filter has to be between omega m and omega s minus omega m and i recover the signal exactly x of r j omega so the fourier transform of x of r j omega is actually equal to x of j omega that i started with Okay, so mathematically, Nyquist said, let's use a ideal low pass filter with appropriate cutoff frequency, and we will be able to recover the signal. What's the problem with this approach? What do you we think? We don't have ideal filters. Perfect. We don't have ideal filters in causal systems. So therefore, even though Nyquist sampling theorem is correct, uh, in the mathematical world where if you had an ideal low pass filter, you could recover the reconstruct the original signal exactly. In reality, I mean, if you were doing a causal uh, uh, processing, which means you have like audio signals, you have like the entire audio signal and you're doing uh, the entire processing at once, you can still reconstruct it because in those cases, you can construct an ideal low pass filter 
But in causal application, which is 99% of the applications, in causal applications, we do not have that luxury of having the entire time series in front of us. So therefore, we do not have the luxury of ideal low pass filter in causal applications. So running a car is a causal application. You can't anticipate the future. Um, you know, having a generator is a causal application. Um, I don't know, your refrigerator is a causal, I mean, whatever information your refrigerator is getting and acting upon is a causal application. It can't predict the future. So therefore, in most of the causal application, you don't have the luxury of having an ideal low pass filter so therefore, in those cases, you will use a reasonable low pass filter, not the ideal one. And there we get your XR of T, which is not equal to X of T and you have to make some trade-offs. The trade-offs are necessary so that your reconstruction signal is reasonable approximation of X of T. Because a low pass filter, a, a, a natural, I mean, a causal low pass filter will change the, not only the magnitude characteristics, but also the phase characteristic of the signal. So therefore, you know, the reconstruction signal will be off both in magnitude as well as in the phase of the input signal. And one has to be okay. Like one has to design a filter in such a way that you're okay with uh, attenuation of certain signals or amplification of certain frequencies and phase changes in certain frequencies. So it's just uh, something you will learn on the job and it would depend on the specific applications that you are looking at. So if you're looking at biomedical applications, it's okay to have some phase distortion. If you're looking at audio processing, like if you go to work for Amazon Alexa or something, then there would be certain phase shifts that are okay, but other phase shifts are not okay. So you will just learn on the job what a reasonable low pass filter is going to look like based on the application. Okay. Any questions so far? Any question on this, on this uh, slide or page? Okay, so mathematically very elegant result. Unfortunately, not useful for causal applications. It's okay for non-causal application, but not okay for causal applications. So some trade-offs are required. That's the TLDR version of what I was saying. Okay, so now let's talk about sampling with zero order hold. What we talked about right now, I have a signal X of T and I sample 
and I get like a discrete time signal. Now in some applications, you can't really input a discrete time signal. So what you have to do is you have to do a zero order hold, Z-O-H, zero order hold. And what that does is it holds the signal at that constant value until the next jump happens. So what you will get is, something like this. You said the zero order hold, could you, I heard what you said and I understand, I just would like you to, to repeat it and not re-explain right. it. Right, right. So in zero order hold, you are keeping the signal constant until the next jump happens. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the signal is constant until the next jump happens, then the signal is constant until the next jump happens and so on, okay? This is how the zero order hold works. So this is sampling with zero order hold. So in this case, we have X of T, which gets multiplied to P of T, and we get X P of T, and then, I am going to pass it through a system that just holds the signal for a certain time step. So this is the impulse response of the system. It, it, the impulse input comes at time zero. It holds that input for time duration capital T, and then after that, the signal gets goes back to zero. The output goes back to zero. So this is the impulse response of the zero order hold system. And what you get is uh, X zero T, which is the zero order hold version of X of T. So you have a time varying signal and you have converted that time varying signal to a piecewise constant signal. converted a time varying signal to a piecewise constant signal using this concept of zero order hold. Okay, so now we have got X zero of T, which is the zero order hold signal. Can we reconstruct X of T? What's wrong? Yeah. Can we reconstruct X of T? Turns out that we can do it. Let's look at some pictures first. So this is my this is my overall schematic going from x of t to x zero of t. We just saw that. So this is my x of t. This is my x p of t. This is my x zero of t, which is basically holding the signal until the next jump happens. Okay. Now the question is, how do we recover x of t from here? Can we recover x of t? It turns out that we can, we have to use a specific uh, transfer function. So here it is. So this is what my X zero of T is. And I know that for XP of T, if I pass it through an ideal low pass filter, ideal low pass filter, then I can recover the signal exactly. So R of T will be equal to X of T. Okay, so I want my H of R J omega, this, this system to be equal to 
H of I L P J omega, the ideal low pass uh, filters transfer function over, let me call it H zero of J omega and H zero is the transfer function of this particular block. And you can write H zero of J omega as, so I can actually compute it in closed form, E raised to minus J omega capital T over two. I'm just copying it from the book, but the derivation is perhaps not that complicated. I just haven't tried it before. This is what the, H zero of J omega looks like. This is the transfer function of this block that holds the signal for capital T time steps. And so from that, we get the expression for H of R J omega. Will we need to um, calculate the, the the ideal transfer function for, for the ideal filter or, or is that gonna be provided or how's that gonna work out for us? Well, for the ideal filter, it's very easy because it's just, it's just this, right? It's one oh, yeah. and it's omega C. So as long as you know what the value of minus omega C and omega C is, um, the ideal low pass filter is pretty straightforward. Okay. But yes, in the case of real filters, so let's say you use an RC circuit as a ideal low, I mean, not in replacement of low pass filter, you use an RC circuit. So then of course the, the uh, frequency response of the system would be dependent on the value of R and the value of C, the resistance and the capacitance of the resistor and capacitor there. So, so those in those cases, most likely, uh, so well, there is there is a question for the exam where R and C values will be given, but in life you will have to pick the R and C value by making appropriate trade-offs. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. So once again, if you don't use the ideal low pass filter, if you're using a usual filter, a low pass filter, then uh, there will be distortion in the signal and you have to make trade-offs in the design of the filter itself so that uh, so that you 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 meet all the distortion um, constraints on the signal reconstruction so that's all i have for today we are going to finish a little early uh, but we'll start a new topic in the next class which is uh, uh, reconstructing the signal using linear interpolation and so on so we'll talk about it in the next class. Uh, at this point of time, I think uh, we are going to have quiz two, a uh, quiz three on, initially I was thinking March 31st, but I realized March 31st is a holiday. I mean, it's, it's a spring break, so, or spring break number two. So now I'm going to have the second, the third quiz on March 29th. I will send out an announcement pretty soon, but please uh, remember that quiz three will be on March 29. And uh, that's it. Uh, I'll stay back if any of you have questions. Thank you for your attention.